This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, since 1990, has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. We'd like to encourage those of you who are not yet members to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. Our members receive an informative newsletter as well as discounts at grocery stores such as Down to Earth, All Vegetarian, Organic and Natural, and many vegetarian and vegetarian friendly restaurants. And you may also be invited to participate in enjoyable social events. We're also very happy to announce tonight that Down to Earth has decided to extend its 5% discount to VSH members to its Maui store as well. By the way, VSH also recently staffed a table sponsored by the Indian Student Association at the University of Hawaii Manoa's Student Involvement Fair on September 1st. We worked with Sachin Ruikar, the president of ISA, to help students and other table visitors learn about plant-based diets and VSH activities, and we were also able to help collect names on behalf of the UH Vegetarian Club as well. We're videotaping tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Olelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and currently on Thursdays at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website, vsh.org, to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. Well, it's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Joseph Kian, Ph.D., a wellness consultant for more than 25 years. Dr. Kian holds fitness expert certifications by both the Cooper Institute for Aerobics Research in Dallas, Texas, and the American Council on Exercise, and is a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He is past chairman of the board of directors for Dr. Helen Caldicott's Nuclear Policy Research Institute and past member of the Marin Health Council, an advisory board to the Marin County Board of Supervisors. He has been featured in numerous magazines and newspapers internationally and has also appeared on local and national broadcasts. Dr. Keon's presentation tonight is entitled Dairy, Essential Nutrition or Health Saboteur. Please welcome Dr. Joseph Keon. Good evening. I just want to uh, thank the Vegetarian Society for inviting me to be here tonight. Uh, I can't think of a more beautiful place to be, and it's exciting to be here and be able to share this information with you. There's so much information in this book that I'd love to share with you, and of course we're limited by time tonight. And so I've tried to condense the information and just focus on some areas that are really, really important to me, and I think you'll find important as well, information that you won't easily come across, say, in Newsweek or Time or even the New York Times or maybe your favorite health publication. And so I'm going to do some uh, kind of a broad brushstrokes overview of where we are with regard to bone health today and the conventional wisdom about diet and its role in bone health. And then we'll switch gears and focus in more detail on a couple of areas, particularly with regard to contaminants in milk. And we'll just look at kind of generally what is required to build and maintain bone integrity throughout the life. 
and then we can go into Q&A, and if there's an area that some of you want to focus on in more detail, we can do that. But I know that all of you know a lot about milk already. All of us know a lot about milk because we've been students of the dairy industry's teachings from a very young age, probably kindergarten, most of us. The dairy industry has been teaching us about milk for just over 70 years. And so we know that it's pure, we know it's wholesome, it's full of goodness. It's part of good parenting, right? Giving your children milk. It's essential for human health, especially bone health, right? Now, if you've been talking to people like I have for the last year and a half, working on a documentary film about this subject, you would find out just how deeply rooted that mythology I just referenced is and how difficult most people find it to extricate themselves from that. It's like our collective common sense has been put out to pasture by the most powerful and influential advertising campaign in history. It's a campaign that has transcended the normal boundaries that keep commercial interests at bay, and it has infiltrated the medical community, the political community, the educational community, the nutrition and dietetics community, such that it's almost impossible to find anybody who hasn't been touched by or persuaded by the perverted message of this campaign. But in the end, what we're talking about here is we're just talking about another business selling a product, like one that sells luggage or car tires or hairbrushes. And they are driven by certain principles that a lot of businesses are that propel them forward. First, what you want to do is you make your product as cheaply as you possibly can. Then you convince consumers of an absolute need for that product. And then you advertise it to them relentlessly. And the dairy industry has done a masterful job in this respect. Now, if we were talking about car tires or something else fairly innocuous, we wouldn't be so concerned. But what we're talking about here are the mammary gland secretions of another species. And those secretions that we call milk are a carrier for a whole plethora of hormones, growth factors, pesticides, herbicides, rocket fuel, flame retardants, dioxin, and the list goes on. I know it's hard to believe, pure and white as snow, but that's what you find in every glass of milk. When I look at this list of diseases, contaminants, etc., that are in milk, the question that comes to my mind is, is the exposure justified? Is it justified? We all have to make, uh, take risks every day of our life. And we kind of look at the risk-benefit ratio. We get in a car, we're taking a risk. We get in a plane, we're taking a risk. Certain medications we take disclose a whole list of risks. But in the end, we decide to do a lot of these things because the benefits are so great. So the question is, are the benefits justifying the risks that we're going to talk about a little bit later on? I suggest not. I suggest that, in fact, the data that's available indicates that there really is no benefit like we've been promised by the dairy industry all these years. I'm going to give you a little snapshot of osteoporosis in this country and what's really going on. We have 12 million Americans currently suffering from osteoporosis. Another 34 million are at elevated risk because they have something called osteopenia. Osteopenia is nothing other than less than an idealized bone density. It's not an accurate predictor of future bone fracture, but it does warrant caution. Every year, 340,000 Americans are hospitalized for up to three weeks for a surgical intervention to deal with bone fracture at a price tag of about $28,000 and over a lifetime of about $82,000. Many people after this procedure will not enjoy ever again the sense of independence and mobility that they did prior to that intervention. Some, because of complications, will be rendered dependent upon others for the rest of their life. And a small number will actually die because of the procedure. So this is a very serious situation. If you look around the world, you see a similar trend. It's not just in North America. It is, in fact, the very societies where the most calcium and the most milk is consumed that you see the highest risk of bone fracture. So Australia, New Zealand, North America, Western European nations, 
where everyone has a milk mustache. That's where you see the highest risk. But in places like Thailand, Vietnam, China, Japan, where people aren't obsessing over calcium, where dairy doesn't play a big role in the diet, you see just the opposite. You see people in their seventh and eighth decade of life enjoying robust bone health, independence, high level of mobility. So this goes against everything that we've been told. This goes against everything that we know deep in our bones, right? How can this happen? How can this be? Well, there was a researcher some years back out at Harvard. His name was Hegstead, Mark Hegstead. Very highly respected individual, was involved in determining appropriate uh, daily intakes of a variety of micronutrients with the federal government. He was also a calcium researcher. Did a lot of research on calcium, published in the peer-reviewed literature. And late in his career, Mark Hegstead said, it will be embarrassing enough if the current calcium hype proves useless, but it will be immeasurably worse if it proves detrimental to health. So how might our preoccupation with calcium prove to be detrimental to our health? There's a variety of different ways, and that's what I want to talk to you about now. First thing I want to talk about is hormones. Why should we be concerned about hormones? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Breast and prostate cancer being two important ones. You probably are aware that breast and prostate cancer rates have skyrocketed over the last couple of decades. Breast cancer, for instance, 143,000 women will be diagnosed this year. 42,000 of them will die. A woman stands a one in eight chance of developing the disease in her lifetime now. Now, if you look at all of the conventionally accepted risk factors for breast cancer, I'm talking about early menarche, late menopause, late, or, uh, late births or not having children, not breastfeeding, alcohol consumption, estrogen replacement therapy. All of these elements bring us back to one common thing, and that is our cumulative lifetime exposure to estrogen. So you may wonder, how do we control our exposure to estrogen? One of the most important ways is diet. And I was talking to someone recently, and uh, the subject of hormones came up, and they said, oh, I, I, I uh, only eat uh, organic dairy, so there's, you know, I don't get any hormones. And I said, well, actually, there's really no difference. And I knew that they were talking about recombinant bovine growth hormone. But in reality, an eight-ounce glass of milk has nearly 60 different hormones and growth factors in it. And in the case of breast cancer, one of the elements we want to be concerned about is estrogen. We do something in the dairy industry in this country that other dairying nations do not do. We want to get as much milk as possible from these cows. And so we tend to milk them just over 300 days a year, including throughout their pregnancy. And what happens over the course of a cow's pregnancy is the amount of hormones in the milk goes up. Such that if you compare a glass of milk that's taken from a cow that's not pregnant and one that's in late stage pregnancy, the level of estrogen in it is 33 times higher in the milk derived from the cow in late stage pregnancy. That's not going to be on the milk cart. It's not something that's discussed openly. But in fact, it is the way it is in the dairy industry in this country. How else can we address estrogen levels? Well, when dairy makes up a big part of the diet, it contributes a significant amount of dietary fat to the diet. And dietary fat increases estrogen levels. As fat intake goes up, estrogen levels go up. As fat intake goes down, estrogen levels drop. And putting women on a, a low-fat diet, high-fiber diet, you can change their estrogen levels in a matter of weeks dramatically. There's a couple reasons. There's the fat intake, but there's also the fiber. As more and more dairy comes into the diet, we displace the fiber-rich foods, and there's no fiber in any dairy products. And fiber controls hormone balance as well.
because after the body's finished using estrogen for a particular task, it's set down through the bile ducts, it's bound with fiber and excreted through the body. But if there's not adequate fiber present, the estrogen can be reabsorbed and it can increase estrogen levels in the body again. So as you take in more dairy, you take in more and more foods that do not have adequate fiber. There's another element in dairy that I want to talk to you about, and that's IGF-1, insulin light growth factor 1. IGF-1 is one of the hottest topics in oncology today because researchers know that men and women with the highest levels of IGF-1 are at substantially elevated risk of developing breast cancer and prostate cancer. And with regard to cow's milk, we see that as IGF-1 levels go up, for instance, with breast cancer, a woman who is pre-menopause, who has the highest levels of IGF-1, may have up to a seven times elevated risk of developing that disease. A woman who's post-menopause may have up to a, a triple, tripling of the risk, if she has, compared to people who have the lowest levels of IGF-1. There's a couple of things going on. First of all, in the dairy industry, we've been favoring cows that are high IGF-1 producers. Why? Because they produce more milk. So back to that number one business principle, manufacture your product as cheaply as you can, less feed, less money, more milk, more profit. So we've been breeding to favor the high IGF-1 producers so that we have these herds that are full of cows that produce elevated levels of IGF-1, which is expressed in the milk, and we consume it. The second thing is, is the use of RBGH, recombinant bovine growth hormone. The way that this makes cows produce more milk is, is it boosts their IGF-1 production. So you have a double whammy here. You have the cows that are bred to favor the high IGF-1 producers, and then you have the use of RBGH, and you have another, another way that's elevating these levels. So is it affecting us? Indeed it is. We know that if you give an 8-ounce glass of milk to an adolescent, 8 ounces is good for boosting their circulating IGF-1 levels by 10%. It takes about three times that to elevate an adult's IGF-1 levels. But we consume a lot of dairy in this country. So what, it is, what is it about IGF-1? IGF-1 is highest at the time of puberty, and it acts on the receptor site on, on breast tissue. But after puberty, it tapers off. It's never that high again, unless, of course, we're doing something to elevate it. But IGF-1 is mitogenic. That means it promotes cell division. It's required for tumor formation. It promotes metastasis. And that's when you no longer have a localized cancer, you know, we can deal with localized cancers. We can excise tumors. We're getting pretty good at that. But when you have metastasis, you have cancer that colonizes other organs in the body. And then you have a really difficult situation. Metastasis is what kills. IGF-1 is required for that. And then it's also anti-apoptotic, which means apoptosis is a process whereby cells have a kind of a suicide mechanism. When a rogue cell is on its way to becoming malignant and leading to cancer, it self-destructs. That's one of the protective mechanisms in our body. But IGF-1 interferes with that. So IGF-1 in elevated levels is a bad actor on a lot of different levels. And it's something we don't want to promote the levels of in the body. If we shift over to prostate cancer, prostate cancer is sort of like I say men's breast cancer. I wrote a book on breast cancer, and it's amazing how similar the risk factors, the lifestyle risk factors are for the disease. Prostate cancer now strikes one in six men in their lifetime. And IGF-1 levels have been correlated with prostate cancer risk as well, quite substantially. So men who have the highest levels of IGF-1 before age 60 have about a four times elevated risk. After age 60, that risk goes up to eight times compared to people who are, who are maintaining the lowest levels of IGF-1. If you look at the literature today, there's over 20 studies correlating high dairy intake and risk for prostate cancer. In fact, the National Cancer Institute has said that dairy intake is the most accurate dietary predictor for future prostate cancer in the scientific literature today. It's a pretty strong association. 
The next thing I want to talk about is dioxin. Dioxin, most people first heard about this after the Vietnam War, after men and women who were participating in that war came back home, and we started to see elevated rates of a variety of diseases and couldn't understand why, what these symptoms were about. And then as as men and women, soldiers from the war, began building families, we started to see similar types of symptoms and diseases in their offspring. And researchers began to look at this but couldn't quite figure out what was going on. And with a little bit of prodding, eventually the federal government acknowledged that they used something over in uh, the theater of war called Agent Orange. Agent Orange is a defoliant. And the intention was to defoliate the jungle, to get rid of all of the growth so that our enemies couldn't hide. And so about 30 million gallons of Agent Orange was sprayed all over Vietnam. The thing about the uh, Agent Orange is it was contaminated with enormous levels of dioxin. Dioxin is a byproduct of chemical manufacturing, manufacture of pesticides, but it also is produced when you incinerate waste, especially medical waste. IV bags, drip tubes, drainage tubes, syringes, that kind of thing. A lot of that stuff is incinerated in hospital medical incinerators, and it produces dioxin, which moves through the environment, comes down with the rain, enters the waterways, is taken up by the plants, eaten by the animals, and then we take it in. It's a hand-me-down poison. Dioxin is linked to so many different negative health consequences the list is unbelievable. We know it's a very potent carcinogen. It behaves like a hormone, a synthetic hormone. It's persistent in the body. It's lipophilic. It binds with fat molecules. Stays in the body for a long time until, say, fat is, in the, in the case of, manufacture, of producing milk, a cow mobilizes its fat stores to make milk. So the chemicals that have been stored in the fat are then released into the milk. And dioxin is one of them. It's in very high levels. If you look at the chart inside the handout tonight, you'll see that second only to meat, dairy is one of the biggest sources of dioxin in the diet. A couple of years back, the Center for Science in the Public Interest did a big story, a cover story on dioxin. They interviewed dioxin researchers all over the world. And one of their conclusions was if somebody wanted to reduce their exposure to dioxin, best thing they could do was cut back their consumption of dairy, which is kind of surprising that they actually put that in there. You can see in there the the immune disorders, allergy, attention deficit, learning disabilities, uh, birth defects, thyroid disorders, type 1 diabetes. You know, when I see these kinds of things and you see how pervasive they are in society today, The question I ask is, what are we being exposed to with ubiquity? Because you don't see these things in clusters. You know how many people are talking about ADD and developmental disorders and learning disabilities. University professors, even high school teachers are saying, those who have been in in that work for a long time are saying, I don't get it, you know, we're having to dumb everything down. Students can't stay focused as long as they used to. They can't take in as much information. We've got to chunk it. We've got to take more breaks. So I ask, what is it we're being exposed with ubiquity across the board? Dioxin is one of those compounds. Because of the broad spread consumption of dairy, it's one of those things that all of us who consume dairy are getting exposed to at a very high level. So that's one of the elements we need to pay attention to. Pesticides are another one. Um, There's 16,000 different pesticide formulas that are approved by the FDA in the United States. And there are a bunch of other ones that we used to sell here and manufacture here, but eventually they got pushed out of the country. So they're manufactured outside the country, and then they're applied to foods that we import here and eat. Pesticides are designed basically to destroy the nervous system of unwanted critters. So it should be no surprise to us that research has shown that people who have high exposure to pesticides whether through food or through occupational exposures, tend to have a higher risk of neurological disorders, like Parkinson's. We see that uh, Parkinson's, interestingly, 
is about 60% higher the risk of that disease in those who consume the most milk. And researchers have seen this come up several times in different studies. And they said, well, what is it? What is it about milk that may elevate risk for this disease? And in the end, the prime culprit that has been identified is pesticides, again, because they're neurodegenerative or neurotoxic. Studies have been done on lab animals where they have applied popular pesticide chemicals like Paraquat, and they've been able to produce Parkinson's-like symptoms in the animals very quickly. So this is something, again, we should be really concerned about. The number of pesticides identified in milk, the FDA's own data shows that pesticides are present in all 740 samples that they've taken randomly. There's an organization based in San Francisco, Pesticide Action Network North America. They do wonderful work advocating for a pesticide-free global community, looking at integrated pest management and other alternatives. They have published the FDA's data in a, in a database system called whatsonmyfood.org. They even have an iPhone app for it. You can go on that and put various foods, including milk, and you can look at the various chemicals that are regularly identified in milk, and you can look at the health effects of being exposed to such chemicals. Again, this isn't going to show up on the milk carton. Nobody's talking about this. These work great for the people who want to get rid of the pests, but they shouldn't be going into our body, and they shouldn't be going into the bodies of our children either. Perchlorate is kind of the latest bad actor to be identified in milk. Perchlorate is a solid rocket fuel, and it was discovered in milk quite by accident. Some researchers were testing some new scientific equipment, and perchlorate showed up, and the cat was out of the bag, and the story started to break. Nobody's filtering perchlorate out of milk. It's there in most of the samples that are tested. Perchlorate has been leaking from military installations near the Colorado River. The Colorado River is a source of irrigant water for a lot of farmland. The perchlorate's taken up into the plants. The plants are eaten by the animals, concentrates in the animals, then it's released into the milk. We drink the milk. We have another hand-me-down poison. Perchlorate is a suspected carcinogen, but research on it is fairly young. We don't know everything about it. One thing is for certain, it interferes with thyroid hormone production. This can wreak havoc if a woman is exposed to sufficient levels of perchlorate or anything that interferes with thyroid hormone, and she's pregnant. And I'm talking about early enough in her pregnancy that she, is, she may not even know she's pregnant. There are critical gestation windows when a fluctuation in thyroid hormone can lead to permanent changes in the development of the nervous system, brain, of her offspring. And so when that child's born, you may find yourself asking, what happened? Why this? Why is our child going through these challenges? And this is another one of these things that I think we need to look at very carefully because Again, it's one of these things that we're being exposed to with ubiquity. If you're consuming dairy, you're getting exposed to perchlorate. There are other places that perchlorate is fine, but it's very concentrated in dairy. I'm going to jump into antibiotics. You probably all have read a little bit about the antibiotic resistance in bacteria, how today thousands of people die every year in U.S. hospitals because conditions that they have are no longer treatable by antibiotics that just a few years ago were effective. And hundreds of scientists, literally, have petitioned the FDA and asked them to take control of the situation because they believe the biggest problem here stems from the wholesale use of antibiotics in animal farming. There are something like 30 different antibiotics that are approved for use in dairy farming, but only four of them are tested for. Recently, the New York Times did a story on these rendered carcasses from dairy cows, and they found these shocking levels of antibiotics in their flesh. And they said, I wonder if the antibiotics are getting into the milk. Well, we know the answer to that. Studies have been published for years about antibiotics in milk samples. 
News stations have done them, the CSPI's done them, the FDA's done them, they've all been published. And you have about a 50-50 chance that the milk or butter or cream that you consume or the ice cream has antibiotic residues in it. In itself, it presents a problem because exposure to antibiotics over the lifetime seem to be linked with more susceptibility to cancer, and it could be because of some dysfunction in, in uh, the immune system. We also know that a cow that's been exposed to a chronic drip feed of antibiotics is going to have bacteria that develop resistance, and that bacteria can be passed on to us through food products. And then bacteria in our body can assume that same resistance. So we want to minimize our exposure to that as well. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here. It's <laughs> somebody's got to pass this, this information on. Another thing that nobody's talking about is this MAP. The name for that is Mycoavium subspecies paratuberculosis. MAP is a bacterium that is found in cows and we know causes a disease called Yanni's, which is a wasting disease, an autoimmune disease. Where the cow, it's an inflammatory bowel disorder. Cows begin losing weight. They're not taking in nutrients. And it costs an enormous amount of money for the dairy industry. The interesting thing is, is the disease appears just like Crohn's disease in human beings. And somebody who's taken note of this is uh, John Herman Taylor, researcher in London and at King's College. And I interviewed him, spent an afternoon with him, interviewing him for my documentary. And he's been working on this about 16 years. And he's talked about taking MAP out of gut tissue samples from people with Crohn's in 92% of cases. And he's convinced that the majority of Crohn's disease that we see today is a consequence of exposure to MAP through milk drinking. And not everybody develops it, of course, when they're exposed. There is some genetic susceptibility. You may have heard or may not have heard reports about radioactive iodine-131 in the milk supply. This is not the first time, it won't be the last time, but milk has become sort of the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. That's one of the, one of the first areas that we start to see radiation showing up when there are accidents at nuclear facilities. When Chernobyl blew, within nine days, we had radiation in the milk in North America. This poses a risk, a serious risk, because there's been no safe threshold established for exposure to ionizing radiation. Some radiation we get exposed to, it's whole body radiation, kind of dispersed over our body. But in the case of these radionuclides, like iodine, cesium, strontium, these elements, if they're in the milk and you take them in, the iodine concentrates in the thyroid hormone, has a half-life of eight or nine days outside the body. Strontium-90 is 28 years. Cesium, they're still finding that in the milk around where Chernobyl blew. These are carcinogens. There's no safe threshold again. It doesn't take a nuclear accident. As a matter of course, nuclear power plants are releasing radioactive material all the time. Some people are really surprised to hear that. But again, you know, this information is not disclosed. When you come back to it and you look at, again, the incidence of bone disease in North America, we have been fabulous students of the dairy industry's teachings. We're consuming about 1,145 milligrams of calcium a day on average. We're drinking up lots of milk and eating the cheese and yogurt and the ice cream, of course. But the protection isn't there. And the science isn't there. When you look at the scientific evidence, the majority of studies that have been published stand in conflict with what the dairy industry has been teaching us all these years. So I'm of the position that we have a responsibility to inform the public about the risks that they are exposed to by following this erroneous advice. The reality is that that osteoporosis is not about passing by the dairy case. Cow's milk was never intended for human consumption. We have no need for cow's milk in our body, and our children have no need for cow's milk. And anybody in the healthcare field who tells you that your health problem 
or your child's health problem is related to your not drinking enough milk or eating cheese or yogurt or what have you, if someone told me that, I'd turn around and walk away real fast and find somebody else to entrust your health with. The reality is that we've kind of created a perfect storm in this country and other countries as well by the dietary choices that we make. Someone asked me the other day, they said, if I could do one or two things only to improve my chances of maintaining bone integrity, what do you think I should do? And I said, the first thing you should do is get dairy out of your diet. And the second thing you should do is you should make a point of having a regular exercise regimen in your life, moving your body, using your muscles and bones. I think these are two of the most important things. What we've done in this country, sort of like our preoccupation with calcium, is we've learned to covet protein. And we all want to make sure we've got lots of protein in every meal. And the reality is we consume way more protein than we need. And we end up consuming a lot of animal protein in many instances in the general population. I know not in this group. And that leads to a high level of acidity. And the body wants to maintain a slightly alkaline state. And to buffer that acidity, it draws on the calcium from the bones. The average American is literally hemorrhaging calcium around the clock. And there's been substantial research done on this, kind of like a toggle. We can alter the levels of calcium that are excreted in the body from the body simply by changing the level of protein that's being consumed, particularly animal protein. So this is one area that we've really got to look at. We've got to look at the protein in intake, and we've got to accept the fact that Protein malnutrition is not something that we see in North America. It's something we see in developing nations. And more often than not, it's not about protein per se. It's about a calorie deficiency. So we can cut way back on our protein intake, and that's going to do wonders. Um, there are other elements that we need to look at. Sodium. Sodium intake is, in some cases, off the charts in this country. We consume way more than we need. And just as a correction down there, our need is not 1,000 milligrams. It's about 500 milligrams. But 1,000 would be a good goal for a lot of people to aim for. Alcohol consumption. We know alcohol interferes with the function of osteoblasts and inhibits absorption of certain nutrients. We know it can damage the liver. And we know that when people drink regularly, they're more likely to fall. And a fall is usually what precipitates a bone fracture. Smoking, there's very good evidence that smoking not only brings heavy metals into the body, which are toxic to bone, but it interferes with the function of osteoblasts and osteoclasts in the body and puts you at elevated risk. Caffeine, we don't hear a lot about the role of caffeine, but caffeine elevates calcium excretion from the body as well. So that's another thing to look at. Many of us are accustomed to having two, three, four cups of coffee a day in some cases. And this may be elevating risk for fracture when looked at in the bigger picture of all the choices that we're making. But sedentary living, a lack of exercise, using our body, really is a huge, huge factor here. If you've ever had, a muscle, ever had an arm or a leg put in a cast, and you look at it when the cast comes off, it's shrunken, it's atrophied. Muscle shrinks with disuse, bones the same way. When we're sitting at a chair all day in front of a computer terminal or in a lazy boy recliner, we're just not getting out there and stimulating our bones with weight-bearing exercise, they will shrink and they will become more prone to fracture and we will lose bone density. So employing a regular exercise program in your life is a really, really important element. And there's really good research on this that people even in their seventh and eighth decade of life can improve their bone density by up to 8% in just under a year. And that's with an exercise program about three to four times a week. Nothing intense. So getting out, walking, jogging maybe, just moving your body, weight bearing is really, really important. And it's important also that we model this to the next generation so that they understand how important this is and they develop a sense of interest in it and integrate it in their life as they grow up. 
So those are the key, key elements on the back of the handout I gave you. I included a graph from Whitewash. I wanted to just show you a lot of people are surprised to see how many foods do have calcium. And the best source of calcium is, of course, plant foods because the calcium comes packaged with all the other nutrients that are essential to bone health. You can flood the body with calcium, but unless those other nutrients are there, you're not going to have bone integrity. So these are wonderful food sources, much more healthful food sources that you can rely upon, integrate into your diet, and be sure you're getting plenty of calcium with all the other nutrients that support bone health. The calcium recommendations that are made in this country are, in my view, distorted. They're a recommendation that is based upon an understanding, which the World Health Organization has acknowledged, that when you eat a diet that is centered upon animal products, you take in, you eat way more protein than you need, you take in more of the sulfur-containing amino acids, you produce higher levels of acid, and as a consequence, you excrete more calcium. So you're often in negative calcium balance, and this is an effort to compensate for all that calcium loss. But the reality is, if you are overdosing on protein, and you are also making some of these other choices, the heavy caffeine consumption, the high sodium, the sedentary living and everything, there's no amount of calcium you can consume. The literature shows this. You can consume thousands of milligrams of calcium and it's not gonna protect you from bone fracture, whether it be through supplements or through dairy products or what have you. So again, I think the most important thing we can do is we can turn our back on the dairy bandwagon, we can adopt a plant-strong diet where all of the nutrients are that support bone health and make sure to exercise, be active, and stimulate the bones as often as possible. Question is, in order to obtain all of these nutrients that I listed in here, what kind of supplements should we take? I'm not a big proponent of supplements. I really am not. My, my thinking is that the best nutrition is that which comes from whole foods, where the nutrients are provided in a complete, a symphonic package, if you will. It's balanced, it's in proportion that nature created for us. When we start taking things out of that symphony, when we start taking high levels of this or that, we can interfere with the absorption and utilization of other micronutrients. And so that's one of the concerns I have. The other is that sometimes we fall back on the use of supplements in place of making the most healthful choices we can about the foods that we're eating. And so get the nutrients from the foods first. And, you know, a vitamin, a basic vitamin, mineral supplement, I don't think there's any problem with that. But calcium, magnesium supplements, the research doesn't support it. There have been lots and lots of studies showing people taking substantial levels of calcium magnesium, and it is not conferring any significant protection with regard to risk of bone fracture. Yeah? How do you determine whether you're lactose intolerant? About 70% of the world's population is lactose intolerant. It's perfectly natural. As we get weaned from the breast, we stop being able to break down the sugar in milk. A lot of people don't make the association between their symptoms and the food they're eating, but if you suspect it, you can pay attention when you're consuming dairy to maybe cramping, bloating, some of the other symptoms that come with lactose intolerance. But you can obviously go and be tested in a clinical setting, and that's probably the best way to be sure that that's what's going on. But again, it's nothing to be concerned about because we don't need the milk of any other species at any time in our life. Yeah. Don't talk to me about my cheese. Yeah, yeah. That's a tough one. That's a tough one for a lot of people. A lot of people will eliminate milk and butter and yogurt and even ice cream. But when it comes to cheese, watch out. Questions about the effect on the economy if dairy farming were not such a big factor in North America. You know, I would say that without the financial support of our tax dollars, it would be near impossible for the dairy industry to survive at all. The bailouts are in the billions of dollars annually, and this 
bizarre game, passing out handouts of cash and two years later slaughtering 25% of the dairy herds to bolster prices and then more cows being brought online and then BGH to boost milk production when we have too much in the first place and we're paying to store it. It's a real bizarre economy. But I think if you really factored in all of the price support, the bailouts for bad years and everything, I think it would be very difficult for this industry to survive. Yes? Questions about goats and sheep's milk. Some people are, have, have turned to goats, goats and sheep milk or goat uh, yogurt made from each of these. I, I think a lot of the same concerns apply. Most of the contaminants in our environment end up concentrating in animal flesh. So whether it's uh, milk from a goat or a cow or a giraffe, any mammalian milk, you're going to see these chemicals just like they're concentrating in human milk. So I'd be concerned about that. And again, the thing that I think is so important because we have all been so indoctrinated for so long in this rich mythology, it's so difficult, I think, to step back and say, wait, we don't need it. We don't need the milk of any animal. I think we'll do much better without it. Some people really enjoy yogurt, enjoy the texture, the creaminess of it. They want to put that on their granola or their fruit in the morning or something like that. Perhaps that's the right thing for you. But I think the important thing, again, is just to remember that it's not required. It's not essential. All of the nutrients that you need can be obtained from a plant-centered diet. Oh, the question is about probiotics or back good bacteria and yogurt as a delivery system for that. You know, there's controversy of whether this bacteria actually survives and implants and has a positive effect. Some research has suggested it does. Other has said it does not. Dannon, the Dannon Yogurt Company, released a product a couple of years ago making uh, very blatant claims that if you consume this yogurt, you are going to obtain this good bacteria that would increase the healthy flora in your body and your gut, and you are going to enjoy certain health benefits. They were sued by a Los Angeles law firm. It was a class action lawsuit because the law firm felt that there was not enough evidence to substantiate this today. And I don't know that there really is. Some people will swear by uh, the consumption of yogurt and say that it improves their digestion and their sense of well-being. But again, I think if you look at the literature, there really isn't enough evidence to warrant reliance on that. I think there are probiotic supplements you can take, pill form. You can try that route and avoid the exposure to the hormones, to the pesticides, to the dioxin, to the rocket fuel, and all the other elements that are concentrating in dairy products. Any other questions? Yes? Question about the influence of consuming dairy or, or other animal products on the individual in terms of their consciousness, and I have not seen any. No, I'm sorry. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Casein being the predominant protein in, in cow's milk, there are some interesting studies uh, that I've cited in whitewash looking at uh, some people's inability to break down the protein, resulting in it being in uh, various peptide forms, and in some individuals that may be contributing in a subset of children, for instance, it may be contributing to symptoms of autism. We don't know exactly why that happens. It could be a deficiency of a particular digestive enzyme. But these peptides, which normally uh, would not cross through the gut barrier and get into the bloodstream, apparently do, taken up by certain receptor sites in the brain with regard to the children. Some research has suggested that's been conducted on animals that these peptides are taken up by opiate receptor sites in the brain. And that may be why in some children who are susceptible, it manifests these symptoms, uh, sort of like someone being on opiate drugs, disturbances of their sensory and et cetera. So there's an enormous body of evidence about, with regard to children who develop chronic ear infections and that being an allergic response to dairy proteins. There are about 30 different proteins in cow's milk that one may have a negative response to. And again, you know, this is a difficult thing because when cow's milk is introduced into a child's diet, obviously it's done so in good faith uh, with the best of intentions, and it can be difficult 
to convince a mom to uh, eliminate the dairy. But there have been wonderful uplifting stories where children have been put on course after course after course of antibiotics and they just keep having these recurring ear infections and it's only when somebody steps in and is con- convinces the mom to, to take dairy out of the diet and give it a chance and then you see these chronic conditions clear up. Type 1 diabetes, there's no question, there's, there's good body of evidence that suggests that this autoimmune disease could be related to early exposure to bovine proteins. This is not a cut and dry, clear case, uh, but I think that there's enough studies that warrants real caution. Yes? I was wondering if soft drinks could go on your list of uh, things that undermine bone health. Uh, the question is, could soft drinks be added to that list of lifestyle choices that may place one at elevated risk for bone fracture? And I believe so. You see studies going in both directions with that, but I think common sense, the sugar, phosphoric acid, other elements in there, probably just a good idea to eliminate them. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them over here. And I wasn't able to get my publisher to get books over here. This is the book Whitewash. This is available, Amazon, Borders, Barnes & Noble. And my website is whitewashthebook.com. I have a blog on there. You can read some more interesting things on there, and you can order the book directly off the site if you wish. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Keon, for giving us such a wealth of information about such an important topic tonight. If people, after hearing your talk, are inspired to reduce or eliminate dairy from your, their diets, know that they're, as an extra bonus, they'll be helping out the environment and the well-being of animals as well. So thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, we want to... Uh, invite you now to join us with enjoying some delicious vegan refreshments over on the side here. Mahalo for coming and have a safe return home tonight. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.